Greetings students and welcome to my video on the stationary phase approximation. Suppose I wanted to evaluate this integral i, which is given by the integral from a to b of g of t times the exponential of i times k times f of t. The function f of t is called the phase function. Suppose that my phase function f of t had n stationary points between a and b, which I'll denote using sj, where j is a dummy index from 1 to n. By stationary points, I mean a point where the function has a zero derivative. By the stationary phase approximation, I can approximate this integral as the sum from 1 to n of the coefficient function g evaluated at the stationary point times the exponential of i k times f of s j plus the sine, that's s i g n, of the second derivative of f at s j times i times pi over 4 times the square root of 2 pi over k times the magnitude of the second derivative of f with respect to the stationary point sj. Note that the sine function here just tells me the sine of the number inside, negative 1 for a negative number, 0 for 0, or 1 for a positive number. Now this approximation is better as k approaches infinity, so as the coefficient of the phase function f gets progressively large, the approximation from this formula improves. I'm not going to formally prove this formula and all its cases to you because that would require me to do a full series on asymptotic analysis. However, I will try to justify why it's correct using some intuitive arguments on a fairly simple case, and my arguments will be quite similar to the arguments I made in my video on the Laplace method, links in the description. I'll then do an example applying this formula later in the video. So suppose I have a function f of t with a stationary point, a single stationary point at sj. So at sj, the derivative of f of t is zero. The function is not changing, it's stationary. Let's examine the behavior of f of t in the neighborhood of sj. And to do that, we'll perform a Taylor expansion of f of t around sj. We'll continue the expansion until the quadratic term. Now since sj is a stationary point, the first derivative of f of t at sj is zero, so what we'll do is we'll cancel the first derivative. Now we'll compute the integral from a to b of g of t times the exponential of i k f of t, where we'll assume that k is some large positive number. We'll go ahead and substitute in the Taylor expansion of our function f of t, and at this point I'm going to make two assumptions. The first is that sj lies between the limits of integration a and b, and that it's not an endpoint of integration. The second assumption is that most of the contribution to this integral is found in the neighborhood of sj. This might make you curious, why am I making this second assumption? Well, it's because the second assumption is justified. Let me explain this on the side. Say my function f of t has a stationary point at sj such that the exponential of i times k times f of t looks like this. There's a single peak in the middle at sj and a bunch of waves on the side. Now as k gets larger, the waves on the side increase in frequency more and more. So if our k is 1, our exponential might look like this. It's still peaking at the sj, but if we integrate the entire function from a to b, the contribution of these oscillating waves on the side is too significant to ignore. However, if our k is large, like 100 for instance, then the oscillating waves on the side become so frequent that the integral over them pretty much goes to zero because the waves are so frequent that the integrals from these individual little waves cancels out. Now if I were to integrate this exponential for k equals 100, then most of the contribution of my integral would be in the neighborhood of this sj, in the neighborhood of the stationary point. That's because the function is oscillating a lot outside the stationary point, and the integral over these high-frequency oscillations averages out to zero because the positive and negative portions of the oscillations cancel each other out. But you might ask, how do I know that the function is oscillating heavily outside of sj? Well, there's something called the Coates-Euler formula, which I won't discuss here, that justifies this. For now, you just have to believe me. If we go back to our integral, this explanation I just gave should tell you why I made the second assumption. If k is sufficiently large, then this assumption will be quite justified. Now since most of the contribution to this integral is in the neighborhood of sj for large k, what I can do is only consider the behavior of the function f of t in the nearby vicinity of sj because that's all I need to do in order to approximate this integral with good accuracy. And if I do this, then I can ignore all the higher order terms and only consider f of t until the quadratic term in the Taylor expansion. 
Let's simplify the terms being exponentiated and take out the constant exponential from the integral. Now, I'm going to make another approximation. As k gets very large, this integral is approximately zero away from sj. So even if we made our limits of integration go from negative infinity to infinity, instead of from a to b, it wouldn't really make a difference since the integral is virtually zero outside of sj anyway. Therefore, what we can do is change the limits of integration from negative infinity to infinity. When we do that, our integral just becomes an integral of the exponential of i times these constants times something squared. You probably know how to compute this integral from your calculus courses when the limits are negative infinity and infinity, so I won't do a full calculation here. In any case, here's your final answer. If you're particularly eager now, you can take the i and the sign, that's s-i-g-n, of the f double prime term outside the square root like so, and then just convert this to an expression with base e. So in the end, the integral from a to b of the exponential of i k times a function with a stationary point at s j is approximately equal to the following. Keep in mind that this approximation and the assumptions we use to reach this approximation are contingent on a large k. In particular, this approximation gets even better as k approaches infinity. Now the technique we use to arrive at this approximation to the exponential integral is called the stationary phase approximation. It's the approximation made for integrals around the stationary point of the phase function where the phase function is stationary. If I have a coefficient function g of t out front, then we pretty much have the same answer with the exception of a g of sj term out front, since we can ignore most of the g integral and only focus on the part that's around the sj. In addition, if I had multiple stationary points between a and b, then you could argue that you could also put a summation out front and sum all these terms on the right-hand side from j equals 1 to j equals n, kind of like the main formula that we had up above, which I'm going to call formula a. Anyway, let's do an example applying the stationary phase approximation using the Bessel function of the first kind of order n. This Bessel function, which I'll denote using jn of x, can be defined using the integral from 0 to 1 of cosine of n pi t minus x times sine pi of t. And our goal with this example is to approximate the value of this Bessel function as k approaches infinity. This might look like a really convoluted expression that's far from the standard expression we used when discussing the stationary phase approximation, but we can use a few tricks to convert this to a more standardized form. One of these tricks is to use the Euler formula, where the exponential of the imaginary number times an angle is the cosine of the angle plus i times sine of the angle. The angle is just any real number. The cosine of theta can then be written as the real part of this exponential. And as a result, I can write this Bessel function integral as the real part of the exponential of n times pi times t minus x times sine pi t. I can move the real part outside the integral and split up the exponential to end up with the following. Now this integral inside the real part can be used to make the stationary phase approximation. If we compare this to the standard formula for the stationary phase approximation, then g of t is just this first exponential, while the exponential of i k times f of t is this second exponential, where f of t equals negative sine of pi t. Now, after setting these things up, the next step is to determine the critical point of our f of t, our negative sine pi t, between 0 and 1, the limits of integration. If we differentiate negative sine pi t, we get negative pi cosine pi t, and this derivative is 0 when t is 1 half. It's 0 in a bunch of other places too, but this is the only critical point between 0 and 1, so that's why we're only choosing this. Now when t is 1 half, f of t is just negative 1, while the second derivative of f of t, which is pi squared times sine pi t, is pi squared at t equals 1 half. The sine, the sign of the value of the second derivative is 1 because it's positive. Finally, the value of g of t at the critical point of 1 half is the exponential of i times n pi over 2. Now we have everything we need to apply the formula for the stationary phase approximation. And according to that formula, this integral will become the following. The g of sj can be replaced by the exponential of i times n times pi over 2. The f double prime of sj can be replaced by pi squared. And the f of sj can be replaced by negative 1. And the sine of f double prime at sj can be replaced by 1. When we perform these replacements, this is what we end up with.
This square root term is completely real, so we take it outside the real part, and in addition, we can combine the exponentials to end up with the following. As mentioned before, the real part of this exponential is just the cosine of the argument, which would give us the following value for the nth order Bessel function of the first kind as x approaches infinity. And if you wanted to evaluate this as x approaches infinity, you'll get zero. The cosine just oscillates between zero and one. And as the x approaches infinity, the square root term becomes zero because x is in the denominator. Anyway, that should do it for the video. I'd like to thank the following patrons for supporting me at the $5 level or higher. And if you enjoyed the video, feel free to like and subscribe. This is the Faculty of Khan signing out.